Hi everybody, this is Philip Martin. This is uh, on film, on video, uh, for December 9th, 2022. Well, there's a new movie. There's a new number one movie. Did you, you guys, some of you know about this, and probably uh, if you're tuning into this uh, video, you probably already know that last week or 10 days ago or something that the, for the first time in its 70 year history, the Sight and Sound Film Poll has ranked a film directed by a woman as the greatest of all time, Jean uh, Dielman. Uh, I'm just going to say it in English, 23, Coyo Commerce, uh, 1080 Brussels, written and directed by uh, Chantal Ackerman, uh, released in 1975, is now the greatest movie of all time, according to some 1600 and something uh, film industry professionals, critics, archivists, uh, people who um, distribute and exhibit movies. How is it that a movie that you have never heard of, perhaps, not you, but most people, most people have never heard of this movie, how is it that this movie gets to be number one? It's a good question. It's a good question. And um, you, if you know about the sight and sound polls, oh, and I don't take any of these polls too seriously, and I've, I've voted them in the past. I don't know why I didn't vote in this one, to be absolutely honest. They didn't send me a ballot. My ballot got lost in the mail. Or maybe I was one of the old white men uh, who got jettisoned. <laughs> I don't know if they actually did that. I don't know. But, but some old white men fall off the list every year of voters because they die. You know. So some people who voted 70 years ago obviously aren't voting now, right? Um, but they made, like the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science over the last you know few years, um, Sight and Sound, which is run by the British Film Institute, uh, made this concentrated effort to... Uh, get more people involved, more people of color, more women, more more people that look like the world looks involved in voting for this sort of dubious, best, greatest movie of all time, all right? And so when you take the numbers up from like 850 or so to 1,650 or so, you almost double the uh, voting pool. It's not surprising that you get a new number one. It is sort of surprising that Gene uh, Dielman would be the number one uh, only because, and this is only because, uh, it's it's not that well known a film and even among people like me uh, it's well thought of. It was 35th or 36th in, pre, in the last Sight and Sound poll. They hold these every 10 years. Uh, it, and 35th is pretty good. I mean, it's sort of like all the movies all the time. And most film critics, most people I know that care about film, uh, respect the movie. We like the movie. We think the movie is really good. I think the movie is really good. It wouldn't be in my top ten, but again, they didn't ask me to, to, to vote. And if you had asked me to vote, had asked me to vote, uh, uh, I would have voted a very chalky sort of ballot. I mean, I would have had, you know, maybe the searchers on there, probably Hiroshima Mon Amour, um, uh, Bertolucci's The Conformist. You know, I, I would have, I, I, yeah, I haven't thought about it. I've, I've listed my top ten on a, several occasions in the past, but it always changes. It's fluid. I like Citizen Kane. I thought Citizen Kane was a fine pick for the best movie of all time. If you're going to have a greatest movie of all time, and I keep saying best and change and greatest, and I use them interchangeably because I don't think either one of them mean anything. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is these are my favorite movies. These are movies I like better than other movies. Uh, and I can give you reasons, and I can give you reasons why I think one's more influential than the other and stuff like that. But when you come down to the greatest, it's just kind of a silly thing. Now, the previous number one had actually been uh, Hitchcock's, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo from, um, what, 1958, year of my birth. Uh, and that only... And before that, it was Citizen Kane, Citizen Kane, Citizen Kane at every poll. Okay, now, it's funny that these that the number one and the number two film of all time slipped down a little bit 
but only a little bit, only one place for, for each of these. And that's that's interesting because I guess what happens is you get this big poll, you know, when you've got a whole bunch of people voting, you don't necessarily have to have a, a, a whole lot of people voting for any particular film, you know, uh, because I remember my days voting for the uh, Rolling Stone Paz and Jop poll and then poll, I don't know, 500 of us, you know, alleged rock critics. And, you know, more, a thousand albums would get named you know would would receive votes because everybody is picking their own favorites their own little things and sometimes you're trying to find something that you want to give a vote just because you really think it deserves to be acknowledged or thought about or brought to the attention of a wider public and that's strategic voting and maybe even tactical voting you know um like if you know the Bob Dylan album is going to going to win, and you like the Bob Dylan album, you might list it fifth rather than first or second, you know, because you're, it doesn't need your votes, and you'd like to get some of these other things up in the mix. That's part of the the whole thing because these polls are only about starting conversations. And to that end, the most recent Sight and Sound poll has been a great success because a lot of people are talking about it that wouldn't normally talk about it if it was still vertigo and hitchcock and maybe gene dealman had moved up to say 10th or 11th or something like that i don't think anybody would have anything to say about this but because this particular movie took the top spot there are people who are going to say hey look at this woke poll i don't care that maybe it is, but maybe we ought to, you know, <laughs> allow that uh, just because everything has been as it was doesn't mean everything should be that way going forward. Now, I'm going to show you a clip of Gene Dealman if I can. I tried. Uh, it, I, I, I downloaded one. I think I can show it to you, so hang on. Okay, I've turned the sound down on this clip because there really is no sound. There's just some ambient, you know, noise. You would hear the ruffling of the uh, fabric and the opening of the drawer and stuff like that. Uh, and it just seemed kind of weird to leave it out there like that. So I'm going to talk you through this. Uh, this is Gene Dealman. This is, uh, it's based on um, Ackerman's mother, I think. Uh, it's uh, kind of a <laughs> slow film. It's really she's she's a divorced woman no she's a widowed woman she's a widowed woman she has a uh, teenage young adult son and she takes care of him and uh, basically the movie you see her doing these things like this like make the set the table peel potatoes things like that it is um, yeah it's the sort of things that you she Ackerman's making a point to show you the things that you don't normally see in movies. Now, there is a, kind of a salacious thing here in that she does take in male visitors from 5 to 5.30 every day because she works as a prostitute. But uh, that's not the point of the film. The point of the film is to show you the drudgery of day-to-day -day life and to show you... <laughs> how people exist. Uh, whether that makes it great cinema or not is kind of up to you. It's, uh, there's almost, if you watch this long enough, it's almost hypnotic because all she's doing is, you know, normal stuff, people stuff. And uh, is it revolutionary? Yeah, I guess. Is it uh, fascinating cinema? Well, it wears you down. It breaks you down. And there's something to be said for that. It's not your typical, you know, <laughs> romantic comedy, that's for sure. And I'm going to let it go uh, pretty soon. Let's go. We're back. And um, I don't know. I hope the sound's improved. We're doing some recording in here. And it's set up for, it's not set up for 
me talking into the microphone and it's not set up for narration uh this sort of thing so we were getting a little feedback i think so i turned the, the sound down on my headphones which means these are really worthless now i'm not hearing myself at all so and i don't hear very well okay i have I need, I need to hear things. I can't hear myself. I, but I can talk without hearing myself. I do it all the time. Um, anyway, I, I just hope that the first half wasn't too distracting for you. <sighs> As some of you know, this is crunch time. This is the last few days before I vote on my end of the year you know, polls. Uh, the SEFCA poll is actually due today, which is year today which is <laughs> december 9th not the 8th like i may have said in the opening um we've got to uh, turn in our ballots so that means i've got to watch all these movies i haven't watched between now and then and i won't get to all of them and that's a shame but uh, i'll get to a lot of them last night we watched the whale and inspection i'm saving the eternal daughter um there's a few others I want to look at. A stars, at. stars at Noon, I think I have to look at. Um, maybe five or six more movies to go before Friday, before I vote. I'm conscientious about it. At the same time, I don't think it matters. I, you know, my top ten list I'm not precious about. Uh, I'm not um, somebody who thinks that uh, who thinks it's worth arguing about. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I'm going to list um i have i have a couple movies i don't think people will think of as top 10 movies on my list one of them is vengeance um which i saw earlier this year and which i rewatched recently and it holds up i think it's a very in fact i'm going to vote for that for the wyatt award if anybody out there is a member of sefka and is paying attention to this and wants a wyatt award suggestion vengeance wyatt award okay um, I'm not sure it's southern filmmaking but it is a movie that has a lot to say about the south or about the south as it's focused through Texas uh, and I can't think of anything else maybe I will think of something else but I can't think of anything else off the top of my head that fits the criterion better and that's a better film okay so we're going to do all this and um, it's kind of a kind of a drag I mean I'm not complaining let me let me point out that nothing I do is hard it's not like I am you know working in an office or running a tree saw or doing anything like normal people do for a living I'm watching movies I'm writing about stuff it's not all I do but it's a lot of what I do so I'm not complaining about it at the same time I think that in an ideal world if you're a movie critic well let me put it this way I miss John uh, miss John I miss Roger Ebert a lot uh, I got to know him a little bit it was I considered him a friend uh, we exchanged you know messages fairly frequently um, and I thought he was a really good critic I think he's a better writer I think if you go back and look at some of the blog posts that uh, Roger did in the last couple of years of his life, you will um, understand that he was a oh incredibly sensitive and empathetic human being. That's what you know. He was a great writer because he could talk about human stuff with other human beings, and it, you know I think he was really good at that. I have a criticism of his criticism. And one of my, well, the, the one thing I would criticize about Roger's um, work is that, especially in the last years, and especially in the, um, in the 2000s, and maybe even the 1990s, uh, he wrote so many reviews that a lot of those reviews, which means he was seeing a lot of movies purposefully, and because he was doing that, he would sometimes get things okay, wrong. I think I figured out we can go about five minutes before this thing starts to glitch up. So that's what we do from now on. Five minutes and we'll in and out. Uh, the last thing I want to do is I just want to set up uh, 
got this little clip from James Cameron. He's coming next week. I think we're going to take this off next week. I don't think I'm going to do a video next week. I might. Might change my mind. Might not. But in case I don't, we've got uh, big plans. Uh, I think we're going to have two pieces on Avatar next week. And uh, you guys can have fun bouncing the beach ball. Uh, we'll see you later. Take care. So the actors are in a very pure process. They've some of them have likened it to, you know, black box theater, no set, no lighting, no nothing, just the other people. And so their emotional axis in the scene is not distracted by anything. It's just that other actor, you know. They have, they have that with each other. That's all they need. That's all actors need is an emotional reality to play within, you know. And they, they love that too because we're not stopping to lay the dolly track or to get the sun to the right position or get all the extras into place or, you know, get all the hardware back to one and get ready to go again. We just, we just roll. We just, okay, all right, let's do it again. Let's go back to one. Let's do it again. And we just get into a session. Sometimes we'll record for 10, 12 minutes straight, maybe, maybe five, 10 takes, different ideas. Hey, why don't you do this? You know, I'll throw them a line on the fly. It's a very creative sandbox and the actors really love it. Um, either that or they're very good actors and lying about it for years on end. It's all little details that add up to a fantasy character. We just want you to believe they really exist. I and mean, of course we don't. You go into a movie theater, you know you're being transported to a, a fictional fantasy world. But the more you can suspend your disbelief, the more fun it is. You know, I think, I think people want to suspend their disbelief. They don't want to sit there and pick away at it. You know, they just spent whatever it is, 16, 17, 18 bucks to, to go have an experience. They're leaning in. You know, so there's a there's a kind of almost a, a contract between the between the movie and the audience. We're all just gonna join hands and skip off to Pandora together, and it's gonna be fun. And it's not like we're starting from scratch. I mean, we did we were doing water simulations back on Titanic, but it's taking it not just to the next level, but up five levels. You know, we had to we if we started. Five or six years ago, with our with our study of water and our quantification of it, and how we how we create these simulations, we had to future proof ourselves for five, six, seven years down the line, you know, to be ahead of the curve now, right now, today, as we're as we're finishing the film. Um, so I'd say water was the the biggest problem, and that's something we knew going in that was going to be our challenge. But the beauty of of it is, if if you can solve water for this movie, which we've done, which Weta has done, and we worked with them to do it, you never have to look back. You never have to worry about it again. You can do all water anytime until the end of time, right? So these tools become incredibly important to the effects industry at large. It was such a change from, from working on Titanic, you know, where she was... Uh, uh, she was quite experienced at the time that she, but she had never been on a film of that scale. So it was all a bit bigger than her, you know, a bit overwhelming for her. I mean, she did a masterful job, obviously, but um, but on this film, you know, she'd she'd you know been around the block and done enough movies, and you know, she came in and she spent two or three days watching how it was all done, and then basically started producing the the scenes. Uh, but it was fun. I, I welcomed that, and and it was a. We found it both to be not only a great working relationship and the creation of a very strong, memorable character, and, and she enjoyed all that, but um, um, the, almost like the freedom to be in a different body, you know, to just and to have a tale and to have a way of walking and moving. And Kate has quite a, she's got quite a presence in the film. She's not really like anybody else in the movie. Maybe, maybe Nature is the closest because they're both very, strong kind of alpha characters and of course they clash for that reason and and uh, that was fun watching them watching them meet and clash was is one of my favorite favorite parts of the film the key to it was to shoot really underwater and really at the surface of the water so people were swimming properly and they were they were you know, uh, taking their own weight to get out of the water properly or diving in properly. And, it, and it, it just looks like that. It just looks, 
it looks real because the motion was real. Um, and the emotion was real, <laughs> you know, because these kids are having to learn how to be underwater. They don't know how to be underwater. They, they were raised in the forest. And so, uh, you know, their fear factor probably, probably helped. Although everybody was very, very well trained. And uh, we, we used a very, a very safe and systematic way to allow them to, to dive. They were all scuba trained, but we didn't use scuba. We just did that so that they got used to being underwater for long periods of time. And we went to Hawaii and we got everybody on scuba, but we were also doing free diving training at the same time. I don't think the audience gives you brownie points for making what they think of as photography look like photography. It doesn't work that way. You don't get extra. You only get dinged if you don't do it. But you don't get any bonus. It doesn't make it a better movie in their minds. What makes it a better movie is the, is the people, the characters, the creatures, the things they're seeing, the things they're experiencing. But if they can let go of their disbelief, you know, like, did these guys go to this other planet and shoot it, you know, in, in that handheld documentary style, I feel like I'm really there. You know, it's all working at a subliminal level. It's taking away the disbelief. And if they believe in it and they invest in it, now it's up to the story and the characters to work on the audience's heart and mind.